Okay. Hey, hey there, John. Hey. Glenn, how are Jeremy you doing? I'm fine. Always a good day when I'm talking with you, John, I must say. I feel the same hey, way. Thank you. Even on our busy days today. Oh, yeah, but... Uh, so, let's do... Um, Let's do the birth certificate, because that's what's on everybody's mind. That is the topic of the hour. The president coming out a press conference, uh, mm -hmm. producing his, quote, long-form birth certificate and uh, lamenting that uh, it is necessary in the current uh, political media climate uh, to deal with it so that he can put the distraction behind us and we can get on to serious adult business. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because... Um, my take on this is not the one that I think it, we're supposed to have. Well, John, that and would be the one that you always have, right? No, this is, <laughs> I mean, this the, is, the one that we're not supposed to have. No, I think this is worse because to the oh. extent that some people think that I am quote-unquote conservative but can halfway make sense, I think I'm even more out of step on this one. Tell me about I really, it. I really, I do not think, and I'm not just being controversial, these are my sincere feelings, I don't think that this silly obsession over Obama's birth certificate is about the color of his skin in any significant way. I think that it is easy to interpret it that way, but it involves some pretzel logic that I don't think makes sense. And while I wish that this would go away, and I'm glad that he showed us his long-form birth certificate, I think that the good thinking notion that we're supposed to have, that this is all about Barack Obama being black and certain people being uncomfortable with it. And I want to be specific. Even the idea that that's a major enough factor to talk about. Okay, nobody thinks it's 100%, but not even 60, not 40, not 20. I don't think that there's really any evidence that that's what's going on. Okay, and just I let me be clear. Would move past that. I'm sorry, trying to interrupt. I just wanted to get one point at a time. So the first point is this ain't about race as far as McWhorter is concerned. Not in any significant okay, way. Okay, go on. And what I mean is this. People seem to forget about how people felt about, for example, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton not so very long ago. The opposition to them in some quarters with certain Republicans was so furious and so almost incoherent that you almost wondered if there's a chapter that you had missed. In fact, looking back on the way certain people felt about the Clintons, it's almost as if they were the ones who were black. It was this deep-set animus, and you couldn't say that it was because they were black. It was because of politics. And so that's the first part. Remember that? Yeah, no, I, I remember that there was a lot of Clinton hatred. I remember the name Vince Foster, who was an mm -hmm. aide to the president who killed mm -hmm. himself, and they were accused of murder. I remember the, quote, scandal of the Whitewater issue with the Clintons, mm -hmm. where they were supposed to have been rapacious, thieving, uh, you know, and remember the email corrupt, uh, so forth and so on. No, I remember all of that. But I thought yeah. something that you said, it interests me. You said it's almost as if they were black, in which mm -hmm. uh, formulation you acknowledge mm -hmm. the fact that race carries with it in a special stigma or marginalization in American yeah. society so that when mm -hmm. people are treated badly, such as the Clintons were in the early 90s, it's as mm -hmm. if they were black. And mm -hmm. yet when we actually have a black person who's being treated arguably badly, mm -hmm. you're unwilling to ascribe it to his blackness. Do I detect yep. the least inconsistency there? No, not no? All, because the vision that we're having is what it would be like if there were a black president. And nobody wanted to say that that's what the problem was, but there was this animus that was completely out of control. Now, the way the Clintons were being treat treated, there was an animus that seemed completely out of control, as if that scenario, which I'm treating as hypothetical, was going on. It was as if what people are thinking is going on now was Okay, okay. Then. So I understand and that. They were. Now, 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 let me push back a little bit on this first point, because we have other points to make on this question, mm -hmm. that this is not about race. Uh, I, frankly, am inclined to agree with you, but let me just, for the sake of uh, completeness, uh, add a little bit on the other side of this. So there was George W. Bush. Mm -hmm. okay? He was a notoriously poor student at Yale, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. I mean, in fact, I think that was kind of part of his you know, cachet or whatever it was that he had recovered from a life of unseriousness to become a serious man. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet he went to Harvard Business School. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he was a bad student at Yale, and yet he got into Harvard. And I don't remember a single person saying, as Donald Trump has made a big deal of saying lately, uh, W was a dummy at Yale, how'd he get to Harvard? Okay, mm -hmm. probably because we all know the answer to that question, which is that his father and his grandfather 
<laughs> have been very prominent people in American public life. And so, you know, a lot of people go to Yale and Harvard without being good students with that pedigree. But in any case, it didn't come up. Moreover, and, did, and just the second part of this, W uh, was reputed to have used cocaine in his mm-hmm. youth. Uh, he never would confirm or deny. Uh, chances are it's true. What he said, mm-hmm. since he wouldn't deny it, it must have been true. That's my inference. Mm-hmm. And what he said was, when I was young and irresponsible, I was young and irresponsible. Mm-hmm. Now, you may recall that the cocaine question came up in reference to Barack Obama very briefly during the campaign. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, the campaign, the very effective Obama campaign, did everything they could with the help of the media to delegitimate the very idea of raising that question, which is fine, mm-hmm. which is fine. But do you think that if there had been the same degree of evidence that Barack Obama had had a misfit youth that, that involved cocaine, as there seems to have been in the case of George W. Bush, Mm-hmm. that um, it wouldn't have been a much more severely debilitating thing to have been said about him mm-hmm. than was the case where Bush was able to brush it off by saying, when I was young and irresponsible, I was young and irresponsible. Phrase the, phrase the particular question more briefly. Yeah, what I'm saying is cocaine touching Obama is death uh-huh. uh, in terms of his reputation politically. Uh-huh. Cocaine touching George W. Bush is, well, he was a young, irresponsible kid and he got over it. Uh-huh. And that difference, which is all the difference in the world politically, mm-hmm. must have, in my mind, something to do with race and more generally with the kind of belief systems around race, drug use, and, you know, sort of uh, social pathology that are uh, that, that account for why our drug laws are what they are and, and you know, no. so forth. And, you know, crack cocaine versus powder cocaine disparity, all that kind of stuff. You say no. No, I think that the, it depends on how you look at this because we also have to see that there is a person in the White House who's black and has openly admitted using cocaine. It really it hasn't been that big a deal because times have changed. The fact is, okay. it didn't cripple him. It was other sorts of things, some of which did have to do with race, that did. I think what And you don't think the, the issue of affirmative action and the racial resentments associated with it are what's fueling all of this talk on the right-wing spectrum of the cable and uh, the Internet about Obama's grades how to get from Occidental to Columbia, no. how to get from Columbia to Harvard. That's not no, about race no. at all. No, no. Why when he releases college records, that's not about race? No, everybody's missing something on this. Okay. And it's Straight about, this out, John. It's about the, the medium, and it's easy to forget because we as Americans and we as human beings have short memories. We communicate about these things in 2011 completely differently than we even did when W was becoming a national sensation. Yeah. The fact is that nowadays we are able to talk at one another 24-7 about these issues. And there's something about talk. It is shorter sentences, it is more emotional, and it is less reasoned. And it has an energy about it. And so it used to be that when you did politics, for the most part, you were dealing with the medium of writing or people speaking in a way that reflected writing because that's what the culture was like and that's what technology was like. But what we have to understand is that any kind of political animus that takes fire since roughly 2005 in particular, in this world where everybody has broadband plus already the 24-hour news cycle and then this thing called YouTube, etc., is that somebody says something a little messy, a little punchy, a little stupid that kind of gets to your gut if you happen to have a certain (laughs) meaning, and it takes fire in a way that technologically it couldn't have 10 years ago. Let me give you a very important example. Think about Howard Dean. Remember how excited people were about him in 2004? Yeah. And what's interesting is, try to remember anything about him specifically now other than the screen. It wasn't about Howard Dean and anything particularly interesting about him. The fact was that that was the moment where you could develop this fervor, this self-reproducing fervor, based on talking over the Internet. And so all of the furore that we're seeing at this point, these variations on the birther idea and the illegitimacy idea that keep coming up and coming up. And I have a third wing that I'll mention later about the whole notion of illegitimacy. These things are fueled by the fact that everybody can sit in a circle and whip, e- whip each other up as if they were at summer camp. Well, John, it makes okay, John, sense. okay, I got it. I see how the changed media environment uh, facilitated by technological innovation, everybody's so, you know, connected now and, and we go to these chat rooms and so forth. I see how just generically that might be a boon to rumor, 
uh, innuendo and gossipy kind of uh, public communication of all kinds. So, so your your observation would apply across a broad range of phenomena. What it doesn't do, though, is uh, it seems to me account for the particular content, and maybe this takes you to your second point: the particular content of this kind of cloud uh, that has been, um, you know, uh, created around Obama. That content being, he's not one of us. Okay, that content being, as you say, delegitimate, born in a foreign land. Muslim on his birth certificate, you know, I mean all of this just sort of begs the question of, you know, if indeed his Muslim father had put Muslim on that birth certificate, so what? I mean, mm -hmm. but, but, but the presupposition that that would be a damning thing leads to people uh, theorizing about Obama's going to elaborate lengths to hide this from the public, to pull something over the public's eyes. A man, a black man, the first black man who's president, whose name is Barack Hussein Obama, who went to a church where Jeremiah Wright was the preacher, who married a lovely young woman off the south side of Chicago, who happens also to be the descendant of slaves, um, that, uh, it seems to me, helps us to understand the particular character of this question of uh, uh, questioning of his legitimacy, not being one of us, uh, a sleeper, a plant, a hidden Muslim, uh, so forth and so on. Uh, no. I mean, why not? I mean, let's not just make it simply race. Let's make it the entire complicated social biography, which certainly involves race, but it also involves religion. It also involves the fact that his mother was a hippie and living in other countries, and that he had a, a Muslim father and experience in his childhood in Indonesia. No, uh, no. Okay. I, mean, I don't. I don't understand why you're resisting this. What's in it? I mean, uh, yeah, no I, I just want it to be a part of the story. I know. I know. I'm willing to accept your part. Why are you unwilling to accept mine? Well, I think that you are in a position to understand this better than a lot of people. And there's an issue here of falsifiability, as philosophers and scientists put it. Yep. And what I mean by that is everything that you say is true. Yes, that stuff is there. But this is the question. This is a very important question. If you're talking about politics, and politics is nasty, and calling people names and saying bad things about them is, and get this, inherently a matter of specifying that someone is different in some way. That's what it is to be mean to people. That's what you do. Now, hold on. If that's what it is to be mean to people, and you have a black president, and let's say, this is my argument, let's say that my, my argument being, you don't like his left-leaning policies. You hate that. And you've got this new machine where you can whip people up about that 24-7. Now, what are you going to use? If it's Bill Clinton, well, then he has this problem with the women. And that was obsessed over. Well, there were these little wrinkles with some scandals that clearly didn't matter nearly as much as the attention was paid. There's this mysterious Vince Foster death. All of that is blown out of proportion, as you and I agreed, to an extent that seemed almost mysterious. Now, we have that. This time we have a different president, and well, there doesn't seem to be a woman problem, he seems to have kept his nose clean, and yet you hate his left-leaning policies, and so what are you going to use? Now, the idea that it must be race and that that story must have something to do with it and you know what that means, means that we're assuming that people who are playing hardball politics are going to gingerly step aside of race because one is just not supposed to do that. I'm not sure where we got the idea that that's what a significant body of people were going to do. So what that means is that if you're going to get Obama, well, if he happens to have this middle name. And no, I do not think he's a Muslim, and I am quite assured that he was born in Hawaii. He's got this name. He spent a lot of time in this country that most people don't know anything about except that it was a Muslim country. So where are you going to go? Are you going to step aside from that? Of course they're not going to step aside. Well, hold on, John. Okay, okay, okay John. You got, you've, had, John, you've had a lot of airtime, John. Let me talk, okay? So that. Okay. No, I'm going to speak to this. I mean, uh, it's it just feels to me like now you're arguing that even if it were about race, who should be surprised that it's about race because they're going to use whatever they can use, and in this particular instance, they can use race, whereas before you were arguing, well, it's not really about race. And whereas, and I'll be done shortly, what I'm arguing is it's about many things among which are race. And so, just to illustrate, Clinton was from Arkansas. Clinton was from a lower class background. Uh, the notion that these ya uh, uh, yokels, you know, trailer trash, you know, all this kind of talk, 
uh, sort of uh, hung over the former governor from Arkansas, failed governor from a small state or something like that, I think is how his opponent might have characterized it. Um, the, the notion that, uh, you know, the Arkansas state troopers, when he was in the mansion, you know, he was out there slumming and so forth, were made, I don't know, somehow more credible or, or more natural to the mind of his antagonist by the class and uh, geographic location of this particular uh, president. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is, in a comparable fashion, the race and religious and sort of social location of this particular president, now Barack Hussein Obama, facilitates a, uh, a media and technology-fueled uh, attack on his credibility and his standing. But, it, mm -hmm. but race has something to do with it. And again, I'll just repeat, I don't understand why it's necessary for you to deny that, even as you stress that it's not mainly about race, it's not only about race, uh, mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, race, racism. And so, of course, it's about race. They're referring to things that have to do with his color and his history as a person of color. Yeah. But the question that we're supposed to be addressing, or at least that I'm addressing, yeah. is whether what this is is something that usefully reveals a racist strain okay. in these people's ideology. Okay. And it's interesting. It's paradoxical. I think that this can be referring to race, which obviously it does. Without being racist. Without it's... it being about racism. I want to ask you a quick question. Okay. You talk about Clinton and the class issue, that's true. What it, what this seems to imply is that if there were a an upper middle class wasp scion, somebody kind of like Mitt Romney, that somehow the tenor of this sort of thing would inherently and automatically be less because you couldn't go for class and you couldn't go for race. Is that what you would say? Well, uh, I would say it'd be different. Uh, I'm not going to say that attack machines wouldn't be mobilized against the scion of a, you know, a blue-blooded uh, line right. of, uh, of prominent Americans. I'm not going to say that, that's, that they wouldn't come after him. After all, they came after George W. Bush pretty viciously. Uh, he also gave them plenty of good reason to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, so, no, I wouldn't maintain that. I just maintain that the content of the discrediting arguments might be different. So as in the case of the, the wealthy inherited, you know, born on third base and uh, born with a silver spoon in his mouth, you know, this kind of, you know, mm -hmm. you remember the Ann Richards born with a silver foot in his mouth oh, yeah. kind of comment? That that doesn't work for a guy like me from the south side of Chicago, okay? That only right. works for a guy whose father was Prescott Bush, you know, <laughs> senator uh, and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And the notion that, you know, he didn't earn it, he, he got it handed to him and this kind of thing, that might be the tack that the antagonist would take, but certainly being of uh, high social status wouldn't indemnify you against the attack. I'm, I'm conceding the point that we're in an attack culture politically. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that in the case of Barack Hussein Obama, the particular forms the attacks mm -hmm. are taking um, is influenced by race, and I'm prepared to accept your formulation that uh, race is in the picture, but racism is not an apt description of the, of the basic dynamic at work here. I'm prepared to accept that. Now let me ask you something. Mm -hmm. um, do you accept at least this part of the conservative argument of uh, the birther animus, uh, which says Obama was never satisfactorily vetted by the press in the first place. Uh, he was this darling of the media who uh, wouldn't really do any investigations into um, uh, you know background associations and so forth and so on. Uh, very little uh, was known about Oh, no, I don't know, let's just say uh, what papers he wrote when he was in college or whatever it might be. Uh, and all of this is, if not a conspiracy, then a convenient confluence of uh, behaviors that have, uh, to some degree, shrouded um, our president in a certain mystery as to where he comes from, uh, what he's about, what his sort of formative dynamics are. What we know about that is what he has uh, deigned uh, to show us and the artfully crafted uh, books and uh, biographical narrative that he's constructed. And therefore, all of that mystery abetted by a sympathetic liberal press and a very effective uh, sort of image management uh, campaign uh, have uh, created a circumstance in which people who, you know, start out not liking him and maybe having questions about him have so little real information to draw on that uh, it fuels the possibility of uh, the kind of phony uh, critiques that have uh, we associate with the Burger thing. What do you think about yes. that argument? I definitely agree with that. He was treated as Jesus, and 
part of the reason that I insist so much that we need to question this notion that racism is still, for most Americans, always whirling right beneath the surface, is that a black man did create that response, even among a significant portion of the white electorate. We knew surprisingly little about aspects of him. You and I have discussed, I think, off the record, what a strange hole there is in terms of what he did up in Morningside Heights at Columbia, where you and I are both involved this semester, this school year. Right. And yeah, there's people project images upon him, including this notion of closet, Muslimhood, etc. Because there was a certain mysteriousness which he got a pass on from all aspects of um, yep. the liberal media because of his being this black, but not too black, very well spoken, but with a hint of ebonics and intellectual and charming person. Oh, I certainly agree with that. But I want to ask you a question. This is a genuine question because I've been thinking about this all morning. What could be said about him in terms of investigating him or questions that would be asked about him now that could not be interpreted as racist? Let, it says, let's say we get away from Good. the foreign part, the idea that he's a Muslim, that's supposed to be a stand-in for racism, etc. So let's say that somebody questioned the academic credentials. Right. It seems to me that would be, well, this is implying that black people can't be smart. If somebody found out something tacky he did in Chicago, other than maybe being a little suspiciously close to Bill Ayers, if you're looking at him through that lens. If they found that, then the idea would be, why are they picking on him about that little business? It must be because they want to pull a black man down. I can't think of any serious criticism that could be made of him that would not immediately be spun by good thinking people as, well, that's because he's black. And that's what I mean by unfalsified. Well, actually, I, I hear you, and I, I I'm sympathetic to that, in that you will indeed hear, uh, if uh, there were to be a discussion about something negative about Obama, you will indeed hear some of his defenders playing the race card, uh, as Ruby Goldberg on uh, on television the other day. You know, she, she had this nice formulation. She said, oh, they're going to say we're playing the race card. Well, I'm playing the damn card, okay? <laughs> she plays, you know, I'm playing the race card. This is America, I'm playing the race card. You want to hear that? But, but, um, at least the... Uh, websites that I'm going to and the magazine and newspaper articles that I'm reading assessing the president's performance here uh, with two and a half years into his uh, administration, uh, there is vicious criticism of the president as president, I mean, of his competency. I mean, it's starting to be openly said that um, uh, Walter Russell Mead, for example, has a has a piece in the American Interest uh, magazine, current issue that's uh, available online now. Uh, in which he sort of parses the president's performance, you know, the stimulus package, uh, the uh, the health care uh, legislation, the various foreign uh, wars, how he's handling withdrawn from Iraq and Afghanistan, how he's gotten us involved into Libya, uh, how he's managing political relations across the board, uh, and comes to the conclusion that the president is green, inexperienced, uh, and that he has certain, you know, characterological traits, a, a uh, proclivity toward compromise uh, before he has uh, figured out what he's trying to achieve, uh, a lack of skill in uh, dealing with the legislature where he's deferred too much, uh, a mishandling of the Middle East uh, situation where he ends up uh, basically mm -hmm. pissing off both sides, uh, pulling the rug out from Mubarak without paying due attention to the alienation of the Saudis. Mm -hmm. uh, etc. So he goes sort of down this list, and he has Walter Russell Mead has um, the uh, sort of bottom line, which is that uh, the president better grow up. I mean, you know, those are my words, but that's mm -hmm. kind of what he's saying. He's saying uh, it's not at all clear that the man is up to the job. Mm -hmm. Okay, he may yet get reelected, but it's not at all clear. A couple of terms as governor of Illinois, a couple of terms in the Senate. He might have been better able to handle mm -hmm. the incredibly difficult task of uh, juggling all these balls, negotiating all these various sure. uh, pratfalls and so forth and so on. But no, 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 no. America had to embrace somebody who wasn't ready for the job. Now, if that's being said, mm -hmm. uh, and I think and it is being said, a lot. Uh, then, uh, you know, he's going to get no cover whatsoever from that criticism by anybody invoking, ah, uh, oh, those are uh, racistly motivated uh, comments. No, 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 mm -hmm. they're not. And, you know, I just don't think the race card is going to go very far. So I don't know if I'm agreeing or disagreeing with you at this point. I'm just saying he's going to get plenty of criticism, and he's not going to be, uh, going forward, he's not going to be protected from it by invoking the fact that it's blackness. Yeah, nobody's going to Nor should he be. 
No, Walter Russell Mead is not going to be called a, a racist that's, that's in any way. Right. He's just giving a point about Obama the man. We're getting a very interesting race education with Obama because on the one hand we saw that a black man can become Jesus. That was really interesting. And now, and I predicted this back in 08, now what we're wrestling with is that we have to see him criticized. And I will openly admit, so far Obama does not look like he's going to go down as a great president. I mean, maybe we have some surprises coming, but yeah, he, he was green. I think we could have seen that. And he's being criticized. And I do think that we're open to the idea that this black man can be criticized trenchantly without it being about race. It gets a little harder to deal with the equipoise when someone starts talking about Hussein and Indonesia and birth certificates, although I think that the analysis can extend there. But if we really do see black people as equals, then we have to be able to take a deep breath and see a black person trenchantly criticized and not always by other black people. It's interesting because it's going to be a ride. We're imperfect on this. And I think that's part of what our conversation right now is about. And the man's not above criticism. And then the other part, though, is how do you handle dirty politics when the person in question is brown and different and spent time in other places when he was younger and you've got broadband and YouTube? And it's tough stuff. And it's, it, it challenges us every week to process what these things really mean to us. But I just think, and I think we're pretty close on this, I think that it's simplistic. And often I think I'm more simplistic than you. But I think it's simplistic to look at all of these things that are being said about him and think, ah, there it is. That's how people really feel about black people and him being black and it's just coming up. It, but I think it's simplistic. Okay, I, we don't really agree, disagree, I should say, about that. Uh, it, that would be a simplistic view. I, I'm thinking as you were talking about some of the conversations I had with prominent African-American scholars, intellectuals, people that you know, I come in contact with, the names that would be known, but that I don't want to repeat in which the euphoria of Obama's ascendancy was just so, you know, rampant. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we slapping each other's backs, you know, lifting the glass, you know, a new dawn, you know. Uh, one of us is in there, you know, Obama is, I don't know, 13 years or so I younger than am I. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, this young generation of striving, well-accomplished, polished, professional African-Americans, and, you know, you watch him become CEOs of big companies and do other kinds of amazing things in the arts and uh, entertainment and so forth. And now in politics, the highest office of the land. Okay, so there was such pride, there was such a feeling of, you know, real uh, identification with this achievement is something that we, uh, quote unquote, uh, had finally achieved. And the mm -hmm. question that's, um, and therefore, when he falls under attack, of course, we are under attack. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that might explain some of the, you know, really intensity, some of the real intensity that uh, uh, people bring to this debate about the president and to uh, the view that anybody who's trying to take away from the president's glory is, is attacking, quote unquote, the race. Sure. On the other hand, I'm thinking here, there are certain objective measures of performance in the job. And to the extent that the president is not doing so well. That is, let me just put it, start to the extent, extent that he's plausibly um, compared to Jimmy Carter, right? I mean, to the extent that people look at his bumbling handling of our international affairs. I mean, no, no, I'm being a little pejorative here. I mean, this is not my uh, personal sentiment. I'm just saying people are saying this and they are saying it with reason, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, to that extent, those of us who had invested some of our own personal self uh, in his uh, achievements, then we're, we're out there. You know, I mean, if, if he doesn't get reelected, if he goes down in the history books as having failed as president, if the campaign of 2012 becoming, as it looks like it will be, a referendum on his performance renders a negative judgment at the ballot box, mm -hmm. then we will have all... All of us who vested uh, so much in the symbolic, uh, historic significance of his ascendancy, we will have all taken a major hit. Yes, and if that happens, then on the vine, the idea will be that we took a hit and that 
the reason that he wasn't reelected is because people were more critical of him because of the color. That's that's certainly where I'm going with this. That's going to be a very hard for you to resist, and you're not you're going to have a difficult life, John McCord, if you keep uh, <laughs> if you keep to the present line, and if those events unfold as I'm thinking they might. Yeah, because if that happens, <laughs> that is what people are going to think, and they're not going to stop thinking it any more than other people now will stop thinking that he was born somewhere else. And you know, I'm not. I'm not going to fight that fight. I mean, there, you have to choose. But that is what. People <laughs> yeah, are we're probably. However, it's not that inevitable. We're probably getting ahead of ourselves here. You know, the election is uh, a while away. A lot of things can happen in the meantime. But, but Glenn, one last thing is that I must say that I remember that euphoria. I yeah. was up late and had CNN the next morning and all that. Oh yeah. Uh, in the green rooms, yeah, that was definitely. I remember I was Michael Eric Dyson. But yeah, that, that was definitely going on. But for me, the euphoria was not only the Grant Park speech. The euphoria is also seeing him being human. The idea that here's this black man in office just doing stuff, and sometimes not well, and then maybe doing it a little bit better six weeks later, that that person is somebody who is, and a word I don't use, but African-American, and he really is. To me, that's as exciting as the idea of him coming in with a cape and doing everything perfectly, which struck me as rather unlikely. It is, it is as wonderful to me to see him being human as to see him being a hero. To see and those uh, those little black girls uh, being the darlings that they are in the White House, to see the job of First Lady being uh, handled with such a plum by um, someone who was born and grew up not two miles from where I was born and grew up. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty good feeling, and uh, even if the overall judgment on you know how well he performed in the extremely difficult circumstances uh, turns out not to be A's across the board, we can still take some some pride and some comfort in uh, this having uh, having uh, transpired in our America. I should think. Me too, John. We've had a conversation. Let's go back to work. <laughs> we both have to go to work. Yeah, we do. Glenn, I will talk to you very soon. Yeah, me too. Have a good one. Bye.